Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. On behalf of the British Institute of International and Comparative Law and the War Studies Department of King's College London, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this afternoon's discussion about the EU Pact or the European Commission proposals for a new EU Pact on Migration and Asylum. Um, as the European Union continues to develop its migration agenda and as migration realities around the globe continue to evolve and change, this conversation is aimed to inform um, and discuss the plans as well as to see what, where we are at the moment and where do we go next in the next months and years um, in, in the European context. Before we get started, I wanted to say a few words of thanks, um, obviously, to King's College London and uh, Dr. Varaki specifically for, for working with us on, on this event, um, as well as to the Bickel events team, uh, Liam, Bradley, Carmel, um, for their support with the logistics of this event and registrations, etc., as well as the office of, of um, the Mr. Vice President um, Skinas. Um, I also wanted to just say a couple of very quick words on logistics. Um, the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on the website after the event. Um, any, if anyone has questions, you're very encouraged to ask those questions. Um, you should do that via the Q&A box that you can see on your screen. Uh, the chat function is disabled. Uh, you will see it on your screen in case any of the speakers would like to share any links. Um, however, any questions should be submitted via the Q&A um, function. If there's a question that uh, another participant has asked that you're particularly keen on, we ask you to upvote it so that uh, Marie and I can make sure that we get to that question. We can't promise to get to all the questions, but we will try our very best to make sure that we get a cross section of the questions answered uh, today. Um, finally, um, it, w w having said all that, it's my great pleasure to pass the word to Maria. Good afternoon, everyone. It's our great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, webinar we are very much excited about. Um, I think that if we didn't have the pandemic during the last year, forced displacement would be, and remains, of course, to be one of the most topical challenges uh, for the international community as a whole. So when we started discussing with Zampier, uh, we, we thought that we should proceed with organizing this webinar, and we couldn't be um, luckier, to put it like that, to have here uh, Vice President Margarita Schinas, uh, to discuss, to, to address some of the, the, the proposals by the European Commission regarding the new EU Pact on Asylum and Migration, and on the other hand, to have two leading legal scholars on migration and refugee law uh, to intervene with their observations. I would like to say that I'm very much looking forward to this discussion because I think it's a very important discussion to situate the EU Pact within the other developments of the global front, such as the UN Global Compact on so Migration and Refugees, but also although we, the majority of us, we are lawyers here, not only to focus on the legal aspects and the policy aspects, but with, I would dare to say also to other issues such as policy, but also ethical issues that force displacement raises. So on that note, you know, I would like to stop here and maybe I will give the floor back to, to Zampier uh, and, and then uh, uh, Vice President Margarita Schinas, you have the, the, the floor. Zampier, would you like yeah. to say? Yeah, I mean, uh, the only thing for me to do now is to very, very briefly introduce um, our three excellent speakers. Um, I'm going to keep it very short because um, I I'm suspect everyone in the audience um, already knows uh, who you all are. So our first, our keynote speaker will be His Excellency Margarita Skinas, who's the European Commission Vice President for European Way of Life. Um, and then our discussants will be Professor Vincent Chate, um, who is Professor of International Law and Director of Global Migration, Director of the Global Migration Center at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, and Professor es Elizabeth Guild, who is Professor of Law at Queen Mary um, University of London. So, Professor um, Mr. Schinas, over to you. Thank you, uh, and uh, good afternoon. In, in the most repeated sentence of uh, last year, uh, I hope you can see me and, and listen to me. <laughs> so, uh, delighted to be in your company. I, uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to discuss migration and asylum policies in, in the company of um, um, expert uh, academics, but also um, with the um, 
King's College crowd. I, I myself studied at the LSC across the street, but the King's College uh, crowd has always been my sparring uh, partners. And my, my younger son uh, studied at King's, so there is always uh, um, uh, a familiarization with, with, with the neighborhood. So I'm, 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 I feel in great company uh, this afternoon. I'm also happy because you give me the opportunity to discuss um, uh, the topic of migration and our proposal for a new EU pact on migration and asylum uh, with a certain distance, I think, from, from the moment of the proposal, which always uh, helps. Uh, you all know that we presented uh, this package on the 23rd of September. And uh, after many years in EU politics, I think that it's always healthy to revisit these issues with a certain distance from the moment where the proposal was tabled, uh, not least because since then lots have happened, um, many discussions are ongoing, so we can all benefit uh, from, from, this, uh, from this time. Um, when we were preparing the, uh, the pact, uh, I, I read a lot and uh, I read extensively and one of the very interesting publications that I came across was a publication on the 20 years since the conclusions of Tampere. Um, it is a, a work, I think, uh, both professors uh, Gild and Shetai have contributed to, to this work. Um, and this makes me, um, brings in mind a, a preliminary remark, if you like, that uh, EU cooperation in the field of migration and asylum is still relatively young. So uh, we are only looking basically at what? At 20 years of policy development. And I think this is really important to bear in mind. Uh, there is a, a difference between young EU policies and, and long established uh, ones like trade, agriculture, transport, and so on and so forth. Another preliminary remark is, of course, that migration and asylum are traditionally, are policies predominantly seen from a very national perspective and touch uh, directly on core issues of sovereignty. In the last years, uh, as a result of the explosion of the migratory flows, this is something that is changing, but I still think that this link, this direct link with the, uh, uh, the core of national sovereignty when we discuss migration policy should not be underestimated. Now, um, coming back to the pact, uh, the European Union is the biggest and the better regulated market in the world. We still as a block account around 20% of uh, world GDP. We have the second world currency of reference. We are the world's epicenter of soft power. We've done so much together, but I think we have all uh, a duty to admit that in an area where European Union failed to deliver an EU framework for meaningful policy is the area of migration and asylum. Uh, we somehow managed to produce through trial and error in these last 20 years, more than by design, I would say, the current situation, which I will not dignify with the term policy framework, not even a system. I think what we're having today is rather a non-system, is a patchwork of, uh, different uh, regulatory solutions, uh, some stemming from EU law, others from international law, they produce uneven results and mainly they produce more problems than solutions. And many of the things that bother us as Europeans that are against our way of life, uh, the Moriases, the Calais, the Canarias of, of today's Europe are a direct consequence of the existing system. I'm sorry, non-system. So uh, 
this is something probably some people would see this as a blunt uh, uh, introduction of, of this debate, but I, I, I prefer in, in, in this company to be rather blunt. Now, this does not mean that in, in the last years, and especially after the 2015-16 uh, crisis, this does not mean that we, we didn't manage somehow to, to cope, uh, and it was not easy because we had to face a situation when 10,000 people were arriving every day at one entry point in the European Union. So uh, we therefore had to look at the time outside the system to cope. And we did manage to cope. We tripled the number of life-saving boats at sea, we created a, a CSDP operation to fight smugglers. We started organizing systems in countries of first entry to screen and register uh, all new arrivals. Um, let me open a parenthesis here and remind you that the, the butchers of Bataclan went through the European Union without any kind of screening or identification at the height of the, of the refugee crisis of 2015. So we started, other than that, organizing relations with third countries like Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon, and the Western Balkans to address the situation. We started raising funds uh, with trust funds to help Syria and, and Africa. And we put in place with some success limited success of solidarity, let's call them ad hoc solidarity uh, arrangements and mechanism uh, uh, with a bit of relocation, with uh, some uh, uh, reinstallation, with some resettlement, and some legal pathways. So that was the situation that we inherited, if you like. Although when I speak on a more personal note, I, I do not claim innocence of the previous system because as probably you know, I was a chief spokesperson of the, of the previous commission. So I had to assume, defend uh, all this, but clearly uh, the previous commission did not find a way to produce this new European consensus a big agreement on a European migration policy. Uh, that would be holistic, cohesive, and that would make sense. That was one of the most emblematic pledges of the new commission, of the van der Leyen commission, and this led us to, to the pact. Now, um, I feel, as one of the authors of the pact, somehow encouraged that uh, this time um, we may get it uh, right. Uh, we may get this agreement we're looking for. First of all, because now, uh, we have considerably less uh, uh, pressure on migratory flows. Uh, we can somehow fix the roof now because it has stopped raining. We are not in the situation we were five or six years ago. Secondly, uh, it's always easier, or let me put it differently, it's, it's very difficult to work on a site with uh, firefighting, firefighters and architects working together uh, as we tried in 2016 and failed. Now that the firefighters uh, have somehow uh, left, this is the moment to build the new architecture, the new regulatory solutions. And finally, I think by now, uh, uh, one can come to the conclusion that uh, as a result of the uh, 2015 and 16 crisis and then the pandemic and, uh, uh, and the European Union being tested, I think that everybody agrees that uh, some degree of crisis and, and <laughs> pressure on the system is always conducive to uh, some sort of a new beginning and a new agreement. So with this, um, um, I hope uh, not uh, unfounded uh, degree of uh, uh, optimism, we launched the EU pact uh, 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 22 years after Tampere. Uh, 
uh, to be precise. And um, it's time now to sort of update our script on migration. You are all uh, experienced and, and familiar with the details of the pact, which is a big package of uh, seven, eight legislative instruments. So I will not uh, spend our time in, in taking you through all this, but I will uh, uh, limit myself to three uh, main elements of the pact, uh, which I personally always like to uh, present using the metaphor of a three story building. Um, where all three floors have to be of equal resistance, otherwise the building will, will collapse. Uh, uh, the first floor of the pact, without any uh, doubt, is the external dimension. Uh, Europe will never cope internally unless we're able to cope externally on migration. And uh, this was one of the stark lessons of 2015 that uh, uh, we fail to address convincing. We have to find a way of working with countries of origin and countries of transit, mainly uh, to do two things. First, to create better conditions for the people in these countries to make a better life there, rather than putting their lives in the hands of the smugglers in the Mediterranean in the Aegean or in the Atlantic. So, and this is not simply by offering money, which was the trust fund approach. Europe needs to mobilize everything we have at our disposal and create uh, country offers, comprehensive partnerships with countries of origin and transit, win-win partnerships that would activate not only trade, investment, but also visas, uh, cooperation, people to people, Erasmus scholarships. This is what we can offer to make people's life better there. And parallel to that, we should also help uh, these countries uh, which are not many, by the way, 20, 25 countries of origin and transit, to reinforce their systems for border management, to engage more with us on, on returns and readmission, and help uh, uh, incorporate into their national policies uh, this dimension of cooperation with the European Union on migration. Uh, I think. This is something where we find unanimous agreement in our member states. If there is one element of the pact where everybody agrees is the need to reinforce the external dimension of, of the pact and of migration policy, which is the first floor. The second floor of the building is of course, without any doubt, uh, a more uh, robust, resilient management of our external borders. This is something that didn't exist back in 2015-16 either. But by now, it is universally uh, admitted that the external borders of the European Union are a common responsibility of the European Union. And we need to ensure that they are managed effectively. And it's totally unfair to delegate this task to the five, six member states of first entry that would assume this disproportionate burden on behalf of our union. So this second floor first entails that we will have a capacity through the new uh, uh, European Border and Coast Guard Agency known formerly as Frontex that will be one of the big winners of the new EU budget uh, with uh, uh, an overall budget of uh, about five, six billion euros for the next seven years. And with a standing core of 10,000 border and coast guards that will assume this task on behalf of the union. Parallel to that, we are building effective new procedures at our external borders 
to uh, have comprehensive new mandatory screening for all. Anyone arriving at the borders of the European Union has to be subject to a health check, to identification check, to a security check. We need to be able to establish quickly their, um, their um, profile for or likelihood for obtaining asylum protection in Europe. But this is something that we need at the external borders. Uh, this would also allow us to honor uh, uh, something that is uh, part of who we are in Europe, part of our European way of life, namely that Europe will always remain an asylum destination for those fleeing war, dictatorship. And we have to have a way of, of making sure that these people are properly admitted and are able to produce all the documents and the reasons that would qualify them for asylum protection in Europe. But at the same time, those who are not, um, um, who do not fall under the, 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 the terms and conditions of international and European law and will not be able to stay with us as uh, legally protected uh, uh, people, they would have to be returned and we need effective return and readmission procedures for that. So this external borders management would be a second important element in our pact. And the third and final floor, uh, uh, which obviously has to rely on the first two, is a new system for permanent, effective, solidarity and burden sharing between the 27. What we, are want, what we want to establish here in the third floor is that the European Union should have in place a system, a permanent system that on one hand will um, give the assurance to the countries of first entry that when they need to push the solidarity button under very specific conditions, the EU will trigger a mechanism for permanent effective solidarity that will always match their needs with the offer from the member states, from the rest of the member states. And on the other hand, this system should also allow for a degree of flexibility so that those who are requested to contribute to the solidarity mix would have different options. But I want to be very clear on that. Options that take pressure out of the system or effectively contribute to burden sharing. Leaving the solidarity room is not an option under this proposal. There will be no exit room from the solidarity uh, floor. <laughs> if you like. So um, we can, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm now intentionally simplifying, uh, as I said, uh, uh, legislative packets of seven, eight uh, texts, but just for, for the benefit of introducing this debate, and I'm very happy to, to, to discuss in more detail uh, later after the professors. Let me conclude by saying uh, a, a few, uh, raising a few points that uh, are not in the pact, but I think are, are pact related. The first is that uh, precisely to move from the current patchwork and regulatory uh, labyrinth, labyrinth, if you like, to uh, honor our joint Greek heritage with Maria. Uh, no one can leave out, no one can, leave, no one can uh, escape a labyrinth uh, unless, uh, someone helps. Um, in this case, I think the best way to escape the, from the current uh, labyrinth is a system where everything connects to everything else. And we're very confident that the pact provides this. Uh, our previous proposal of 2015-16 did not provide this because the, the, the balance between the three floors was uneven. It was a proposal that concentrated on the third floor of solidarity, 
but at the time we didn't have convincing arguments for the first two. We didn't have agreements with countries of uh, origin and transit. We couldn't organize returns. We didn't have a system in our borders. We didn't have a strong Frontex and we went asking for solidarity. And obviously we failed. So now under the pact, first concluding remark is that we are putting on the table something that is, is a connected whole, that everything connects everything else from screening, border procedure, asylum procedure, return, solidarity, everything connects seamlessly. The second uh, uh, concluding remark is that there are two issues that we intentionally kept outside of the pact and that we will deal with them separately and, and relatively soon. One is legal migration. Legal migration is part of the European equation, but in itself it merits a self-standing initiative because uh, we will be more credible on legal migration if we have progress on the pact. If we don't have progress on the pact, just to simply ask for something more on top of, on top of a lack of progress creates more confusion. So our idea is to come with a separate uh, uh, package of talent partnerships and, and legal migration uh, a bit later this year. Uh, and I don't have to convince you of the need to have a, a system for legal migration in Europe as uh, the rest of the West has uh, both our demographics and our dramatic skill shortages in key areas compel us to, to move. Same thing about Schengen. We also need to draft proposals on the future of Schengen, not least because we saw under the pandemic that uh, the only way to save Schengen is through Schengen. <laughs> and uh, uh, there is scope of adjusting uh, uh, a treaty which is uh, a jewel in the EU's crown of mobility uh, with all the necessary guarantees and security valves that would allow us to keep our freedom of movement uh, under uh, the best possible uh, way. Uh, equally, we will be presenting proposals on voluntary return and reintegration. It's one thing to be able to organize European returns uh, in a humane way of those who are not entitled to be with us. But equally, we have to have ways for these people to be reintegrated into their societies. And uh, uh, these are part of the comprehensive uh, uh, agreements, win-win partnerships I was talking to earlier with the countries of origin and transit. So I think I will leave it uh, there, simply saying at the end that um, Let's take another Greek analogy. Uh, our, our pact proposal uh, may not be the perfect temple, uh, may not be a Parthenon uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with a full symmetry and uh, giving full satisfaction to, to everyone and, and people uh, looking at it and, uh, and admiring it. But we don't need this in European migration policy. We need an agreement on something that is holistic, comprehensive, cohesive, and can reflect everybody's concerns and priorities. On migration policy, nobody's priorities are more valid than anyone else's. So we need to be able to construct a landing zone. Uh, a landing zone where all sensitivities can be addressed. And uh, this landing zone not only will help Europe to overcome a problem that is here to stay, migration will stay with Europe uh, for the next decades, but at the same time, do it in a way that makes sense, that it's fair to everybody. A European way, if I may call it like that. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Vice President Skinas, for this insightful introduction and highlighting the three-story building. 
uh, many, many important and salient points you touched upon. On that note, I would like to give the floor to Vincent initially uh, for his thoughts and comments about this quest for assistance to get out of the library, if, if I can use that as well. So, Vincent. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, and thank you very much uh, for the organizer, uh, Maria Varaki and Jean-Pierre Gossi for, for this uh, invitation. I, I was very, and I'm very pleased to, 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 to be here virtually with uh, all of you. I was also very pleased to hear from uh, Vice President uh, Margaritis Skinas about his views uh, concerning this uh, pact. And, uh, uh, I would limit myself to uh, two types of remarks because, of course, I mean, this is uh, a, a quite significant and relatively long document, and this pact cannot be uh, uh, analyzed in detail without the cross reference to the current uh, ongoing uh, negotiated uh, other instrument. Uh, so, uh, clearly, uh, uh, the idea here, <clears throat> I would like to, to uh, share my view uh, uh, about the pact from a most, um, uh, from a macro perspective, uh, and then uh, uh, some remarks from a more uh, micro uh, angle. Because from a macro perspective, <clears throat> I, I, I'm used uh, to be uh, totally uh, frank and, in fact, alongside what uh, uh, was said just uh, uh, at the beginning uh, uh, in introduction of uh, his presentation uh, uh, done uh, by uh, the Vice President, um, there is a, a long road for uh, a genuine common European asylum system to be achieved. Uh, in the sense that uh, uh, the common European asylum system is a work in progress more than a legal reality. And what is interesting uh, uh, with the pact, the pact, the potential of the pact, first of all, is to create a momentum uh, in order to uh, reinforce uh, and establish a common will among member states. Because I mean, uh, the key issue and the the key issue is not the work done by the Commission. The key issue in the current common European asylum system is the lack of solidarity among states and divergent uh, practice uh, uh, from one state to another, and even sometimes violations of uh, 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 international uh, legal rules. So clearly, of course, the, the EU Commission is a very difficult position in the sense that it has to create a momentum in order to gather uh, member states on uh, one of the most uh, divisive issue, uh, especially uh, since uh, uh, 2015. So uh, 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 the commission is not responsible uh, for uh, the limits and failure of the common European asylum system. But clearly, I'm used to say to my student that the common European asylum system is not common and not a system. And this is clearly uh, how, uh, uh, and I'm used to say so, unfortunately, since <laughs> two decades. <laughs> uh, uh, and alongside what uh, uh, Vice President Skinner said, uh, this is a non-system. Despite the label, uh, the common European asylum system is not a system. And I think, I, I mean, uh, this was uh, frequently raised by uh, scholars uh, like me and, and so on. But uh, the very fact that it, 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 uh, uh, it is also acknowledged by uh, Mr. Skiris is for me uh, a good point in the sense that uh, the EU is also uh, 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 able to, to have uh, 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 an objective view about what is missing and what uh, uh, needs to be done because for a long period uh, of time, it was not necessarily the case. And clearly, alongside what, uh, uh, what uh, said uh, uh, Vice President Skinas, uh, this is not a system. This is a non-system. A system is more than the sum of different legal instruments adopted on the same topic. A system requires a comprehensive and uh, cogent frame in which the different instruments uh, uh, are articulated, once, the ones with the, the others. So, 
for a long period of time, the common European asylum system was more a legal puzzle in which uh, 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 different pieces were put, uh, were put on the table. But in fact, uh, uh, other important pieces were missing in this puzzle, and we had no idea of the broader design. So we have a patchwork of instruments uh, giving also a broad margin of discretion to member states. And uh, clearly, the next stage is the next stage towards a, 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 a common European asylum system must focus on the missing pieces and the need for a truly comprehensive approach. And from this general angle, from this ma uh, uh, macro perspective, the pact, the new pact, uh, is uh, quite promising uh, because it is premised on the idea or at least the ambition to provide, uh, I quote the, the, the new the pact, a comprehensive approach bringing together policies in the area of migration, asylum, integration, and border management, recognizing that the overall effectiveness, uh, effectiveness depends on progress on all fronts. And for once, uh, 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 as uh, 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 an academic working in this area since uh, uh, a while, for once, I see uh, 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 the potential to develop a more uh, a, a true system. Uh, uh, of course, with some limits, I will come back uh, in, in a few minutes. But what is interesting is that uh, we have now a common framework, a general framework, uh, uh, with uh, 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 a focus on uh, management of external borders, uh, uh, asylum rules, including asylum procedures, the solidarity mechanism, which is clearly the most needed uh, missing piece, uh, among others, crisis preparedness, uh, response, uh, return policy, uh, uh, governance, uh, and partnership with third countries, but also uh, integration policies. So clearly here we have uh, a, a lot of important key parameters in order to develop a comprehensive approach. Of course, I mean, at the end, the final result will, uh, the last word will be given by, uh, by member states, of course, in the sense that uh, uh, the, the EU Commission is now uh, with the pipe law uh, uh, launching uh, an attempt to devise uh, a, a comprehensive approach uh, uh, in order to address uh, the most striking uh, uh, drawback of uh, the current uh, system. Uh, but at least I think uh, it, uh, the, 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 the ambition of establishing for once a truly comprehensive approach must be uh, acknowledged and is welcome because asylum and migration are interrelated and there is a huge need uh, to promote uh, a more coherent and comprehensive approach. Uh, but of course, <clears throat> when we look at uh, the, the details, the very content of the pact, there are many things to, to add. And uh, from a micro perspective, uh, uh, we can argue that sometimes uh, the content of some uh, uh, elements are more uh, uh, old wine in a new bottle than a, a, a truly uh, uh, new, uh, 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 substantively speaking, new uh, way to think the common European asylum system. Uh, uh, again, still, what is interesting is that there are a, a, a clear linkage is established between many different complementary uh, complementary parameters. But again, when, uh, and of course, uh, the devil is always in the details, when we look at uh, the, the detail of, uh, uh, of the document, and not the document itself, in fact, but more the silence of the document and the fact that uh, uh, what he, uh, the detail will be further uh, developed in other instruments, because uh, as such, uh, I mean, so the document is, uh, is coherent, so the pact is coherent. But again, there are many uh, cross references to future instruments, to uh, uh, ongoing uh, uh, instruments which are negotiated uh, uh, and, and not yet finalized, and so on. But let's uh, pick and choose some uh, uh, some aspects. Uh, 
supporting effective integration policies. I mean, here, this is an important uh, 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 added value. Of course, this is not new that we need to put uh, social cohesion in the picture. But the fact that the, the, this draft is also putting these within the same uh, 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 patchwork of uh, within the same approach is important. And it is important that uh, the pact acknowledge uh, that the successful integration benefit uh, both individual concerns, but also the local communities, the host communities. Uh, and it was not only social cohesion, but economic dynamism, as it is mentioned. Uh, and uh, and uh, despite the fact that in practice too many uh, uh, migrants uh, uh, are facing challenges in, in terms of unemployment, uh, 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 education opportunities and so on. So here, uh, uh, I think that this element is a key issue for the new uh, uh, phase of a truly a comprehensive approach. But of course, uh, many things must be uh, detailed and added. Uh, uh, for instance, what is lacking here, we all agree about the need of improving social cohesion. But social cohesion is not a, a, a unilateral move uh, in the sense this is not only about uh, 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 migrants and about uh, 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 assisting them in uh, their uh, obstacle to uh, labor market and so on. Uh, social cohesion and integration is uh, uh, a two-side uh, mechanism in the sense that there is also uh, uh, the need to make sure that uh, host population are also uh, to some extent educated to the need uh, about the migrants in uh, uh, our societies, in our labor market, and so on. So clearly, for instance, I was uh, uh, struck by the fact that there is no reference to racism, uh, because integration of migrants is starting with the fight against racism uh, uh, and uh, uh, racial discrimination. This does not mean that the EU uh, is doing nothing, huh? of course, because there are many instruments and so on, but just to to give more uh, critical in, uh, uh, insight on the, uh, on the content of these parameters, uh, which are, again, from a systemic perspective, coherent and comprehensive enough. But of course, uh, more can be done regarding some uh, elements. So uh, 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 um, um, uh, fight against racial discrimination, against racism, should be also part of the picture in order to, uh, as an integral element of uh, 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 integration policies. Uh, search and rescue at sea also uh, uh, is, uh, 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 it is mentioned, but of course, I mean, ah, we know the reason, the political reason uh, beyond that and the, and the disagreement among uh, uh, member states. But I mean, the pact only, uh, 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 the pact only encourages uh, cooperation uh, uh, between states, but it does not attempt to resolve the issue of disembarkation, which is a key issue. So this is up, and I can understand the reason why, huh? of course, but at some point, we need uh, a clear cut uh, 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 standard rules about uh, disembarkation. So uh, uh, encouraging cooperation is one thing, but uh, at the other end, states must also take the responsibility to establish clear-cut rules in order to avoid this uh, problem. Uh, another, Maria, I'm too long. No, well, thank you very much, Vincent, for that. But I, I'm, I'm a little bit, we're a bit, a little bit concerned regarding time-wise, okay. you know, and uh, yes. Uh, I, don't, okay, so, I don't want to interrupt you. Bruce. No, no, no. I, I didn't look at the time. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so two last remarks. Uh, yes. Lawful avenues for migration is another. It is very important to put it in the pact, but uh, uh, it is important for, uh, to develop it further because in this case, uh, legal pathways are limited for those in need of protection and to attract talent. But uh, 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 the, uh, the, 
there is a need for, uh, to do more beyond talent and persons in need of protection, first of all. And I'm sure that Elsbeth has a lot, uh, Elsbeth Git has a lot to say about that. And second uh, aspect also, cooperation partnership with third countries of origin. Because clearly here, the focus on readmission could also be more open to, uh, 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 to also the interest of uh, 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 third countries. As soon as the EU uh, will continue to try to, to sell readmission through assistance uh, to development, uh, this approach is bound to fail. Here, what is interesting in the fact is this is more open-ended about the interest of third countries, but clearly this is a key challenge in the future. I stop now uh, uh, and uh, uh, there are many things to say and, uh, uh, and uh, I would be pleased to discuss this uh, further later. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Vincent. It's very obvious that we cannot do justice to this topic within an hour. So on this note, uh, Elspeth, you have the floor for your own comments and reflection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. And thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for your presentation of the pact. I speak, I think, on behalf of the academic community and the intergovernmental community that we all awaited the pact with much hope. And we wish the Commission uh, very well in presenting this new proposal. But I think I also speak on behalf of more than just myself in saying that Many of us are rather disappointed. Uh, we had hoped for a much more rule of law uh, driven pact, respecting the international commitments of the member states, respecting the new reinforced commitments that Maria referred to of the two global compacts in respect of migrants and refugees. And we were somewhat disappointed by the content of the pact. Uh, Your Excellency, you have mentioned the importance of robust management of the external borders and Frontex. And this has been presented in the pact as part of the need to control irregular migration. But as Frontex's own annual risk assessments uh, show us in the statistical evidence published every year, over 300 million people enter the European Union every year, 300 million, of which there are 200,000 refusals of entry, entry so that's 0.005%. There are about 165,000 irregular entries by land and sea to the European Union. So that is even less than the 0.005 refusals. And the EU has forcible expulsion, according to Frontex, of less than 80,000 people a year. This speaks of a system which is tremendously competent. There is not a ministry in any member state which would not be terribly proud of a success rate in implementation of regulation, which results in a 0 0.005 uh, failure rate. No tax ministry, no social security ministry, no police and interior ministry would not be proud to have such an effective and efficient system. The fact that there are only 165,000 irregular entries into the European Union means that the national border guards of the member states are tremendously efficient. The reinforcement of Frontex, therefore, as a central element in the system, which is then presented by the pact as one which has failed, is, it seems to me, an insult to our border guards across the European Union, which have done such a terrific job in terms of checking 300 million people every year. We have had a drop in the number of asylum seekers, according to EASO, the European Asylum Support Office, by 31% between 2019 and 2020. Asylum numbers now in the European Union are under half a million. There is no crisis 
in 2015, 2016, when 1.2 million people sought asylum in the European Union. This was a European Union of 28 member states. And it was a drop in the bucket compared to the 700,000 people who sought asylum in the European Union between 20, uh, 1992 and 1995 during the Balkan Wars to a European Union of 12 member states, where the um, member states dealt with and provided protection to all of those people flowing out of the former Yugoslavia in need of protection in a much smaller EU than that of 2015-2016. So I think we need to take this into account when we look at the pact. And I think this is why so many of us in the academic and the international organization world are a bit disappointed with the pact, which seems to um, take a step back from rule of law in the correct application, in the application of the Refugee Convention. It seems to take a step back from rule of law in respect of the prohibition on refoulement in the UN Convention Against Torture, the UN Convention Against um, uh, Extrajudicial um, Disappearances, a step back from the European Convention on Human Rights, and indeed very problematic for the jurisprudence, the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union in respect of the application of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, Article 18, the right to asylum, and Article 19, the prohibition on collective expulsion uh, and the protection of individuals from refoulement. So yes, we're very interested in a new approach. We would like to see an approach which the um, UN High Commissioner for Refugees and the Secretary General of the UN have promoted, which is not seeing asylum seekers and refugees as a burden, but as an opportunity. These are our future citizens. And in our families, across the whole of the EU, you can ask in three generations in your family, is there not somebody who was a forced migrant in Europe? And you will discover that almost all of us have at least one member of the family, a grandmother who was a forced migrant from Eastern Europe, a grandfather who was a freedom fighter against the totalitarian, totalitarian regimes in Greece or in Spain. And this is our past. And this is also, I would dare to say, our future and we would like to see this better reflected in the proposals from the Commission than the pact which seems to be so small in its ambitions, so limited in its idea of what the future of Europe is and what our relationship is with the rest of the world. We should be holding up our human rights standards and our fundamental rights protection as a banner to the rest of the world of how best to protect the world and how best to turn to recognize that people are an opportunity, not a burden. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Elspeth, for this very accurate uh, uh, intervention. Uh, your Excellency Vice President Eskinas, you have the floor for your, for your comments. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you both. And uh, I think indeed some interactivity is called for so that our uh, 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 people who follow us can, can understand better rather than parallel uh, monologues. On, uh, on uh, Professor Shetai's uh, uh, comments, I, I agree. Uh, I think we coincide uh, him academically, me from the political point of view that this system is no longer a system and we need to, to craft something new. Um, I uh, took note on the two remarks uh, that he uh, specifically mentioned, one on, on racism and one on search and rescue. Um, you are right when you say that there is no self-standing uh, dimension in the pact of racism, but for a very simple reason, because this commission has put a, a separate uh, action plan 
uh, against racism and xenophobia, which is uh, under the responsibility of my colleague, Vice President Vera Jurova. And this was done uh, about 40 days after the presentation of the pact. So we have a self-standing track uh, for fighting uh, against uh, racism, which is another of the fundamental principles of our European way of life. The second point he mentions on search and rescue, there I would disagree because uh, we do have, and this is one of the novelties of the pact, we do have uh, a specific search and rescue uh, situation. We have actually, for those who, who read uh, the pact, and I, I hope Professor Guild uh, read the pact uh, because she uh, repeatedly used the phrase, seems to, seems that. I, I always prefer to discuss uh, these subjects with people who actually read the commission proposals. It, it helps. Um, so for those who did read the pact on, on search and rescue, uh, there is search and rescue for the first time is becoming one of the three types of uh, situations that would justify the activation of the so-called solidarity mechanism. Uh, we have uh, a situation which is a crisis or risk of crisis. We have another situation which is an exceptional situation like the one we lived in Evros, for example, with a generalized uh, unprecedented pressure or like the ones in 2015 and 16. And the third one is search and rescue. And for the first time, we have a specific search and rescue typology of crisis of situation that uh, is meant to alleviate the pressure felt mainly by our three member states, Italy, Malta, and Spain, where uh, most of the pressure is from the sea, where actually uh, you have to save lives at sea before activating the, the solidarity mechanism. It's not like in Greece, where practically everybody can cross the, the stretch of two, three kilometers and, and, and can come across. Now, coming to Professor Guild, I, <laughs> I, was, uh, and I will be very honest, somehow surprised by, by the tonality of, of her criticism for, for, the very, for a number of reasons. First, I do not like, I said it already, I repeat it, I do not like the seems to approach uh, to policy. Uh, actually, Brussels suffered a lot in, in, in the past because many people either used seemed seem to uh, approaches or did something else, which is uh, uh, use the commission and our proposals as a, as, a, as a punching bag, as a scapegoat for everything that is wrong in this world. So uh, if you read uh, the pacts and if you go through the texts um, and I challenge you uh, publicly to tell me where you managed to spot parts where the European Union is proposing things that are against the rule of law or that are conducive to refoulement. Uh, Professor Geil, this is the European Union. <laughs> and in the European Union, we are uh, the world's champions, the world's champions of human rights, the Convention of Human Rights, the Treaty of Fundamental Rights. We don't do uh, these things. We are the European Union. And if you don't take it from me, this is perfectly okay. I think that um, you should also note that uh, Secretary General Guterres, UNHCR, Filippo Granti, uh, and uh, IOM uh, Vitorino, who are the defenders of the rule of law, all three of them publicly, explicitly, and solemnly uh, backed the EU pact and they were uh, uh, full of uh, praise for the commission's work precisely to take into account this dimension that you, you, you fail to spot or you seem to uh, understand differently. Uh, a final point, uh, which I think is important. Uh, Professor Gail mentioned that she was right in mentioning it. Uh, in the old times in Europe, the sort of migratory phenomena and the asylum uh, flaws that we had, where people, few people, if I say, if I may say, 
that were fleeing the ter- dictatorship from Spanish, from the Spanish, from Spain, Greece, and Portugal, and some different parts of the former colonies in Africa. So the system that we had in place to deal with this uh, uh, type of asylum request and pressure was a different one <laughs> from the one we, are, we, we need now where Europe is subject to massive, massive migratory flows that will continue uh, over the time. Um, when Africa reaches uh, in by 2050, one billion, uh, I leave it to your imagination what this would entail in terms of migratory pressure to Europe. So to pretend that the European Union can cope or deal or manage with these tremendous pressures using the software that we use to uh, accommodate uh, Democrats fleeing uh, the dictatorships of the European South is it will not cut it. We need something big. We need something new. We need something comprehensive. And we need something that does not reproduce red lines, but brings the space between the red lines for an agreement, because clearly uh, there is this school of thought that uh, we are the European Union, so we should simply uh, open up and let everybody in. I have uh, full uh, respect for this approach, but there is another school of thought that says, uh, no pasaran, no one comes in, Uh, enough is enough. And our duty as policymakers is not to reproduce uh, these arguments that touch upon national sovereignty, hardcore national sovereignties, and go beyond that and create the conditions for a system that makes sense for everyone. Um, I'm going to just jump in because I'm very conscious of time. Um, I I know that we've gone slightly over, um, and I thank you all for for taking the time. Um, There's been a lot of questions um, coming into the Q&A box. So I'm just going to mention a few points that have already been raised by Vincent and and Elspeth, but also um, by um, the Vice President. Um, One relates to humanitarian rescue and the criminalization of humanitarian rescue. And uh, the question that's come up is, how is the Commission suggesting to go about dealing with this and avoiding the criminalization that we've seen in Malta, we've seen in Italy, and we've seen in other countries? Another key question that has come up um, frequently in the questions um, and and obviously in the analysis of of the pact, and it's something that has been touched on, is how will the EU deal with violations of human rights in at the borders within Europe, but also in transit and in transit countries that Europe is is now kind of working with? Um, And how do we make sure that those human rights violations or the EU is not complicit in those human rights violations? and uh, <clears throat> the final question is about solidarity and how do we make this effective? Now, before I pass on the word back to um, Vice President Skinas, I wanted to um, give the floor to Elspeth for um, if if she wanted to come in to respond to some of the um, questions raised by the Vice President in his reply to, to your comments. Uh, thank you very much. And Your Excellency, I do completely agree with you that uh, we need precision. Article 12 of your proposed screening regulation will abolish appeal rights for persons who are subject to the screening proposal and a negative decision. This is contrary to every guidance which is given by UNHCR and indeed by OHCHR on how asylum applications should be dealt with. I can give you chapter and verse, but it would take far too long for us to go through this. I am not merely suggesting that this is my opinion. This is a juridical opinion in respect of what are the rights of people who are seeking asylum in the European Union. And I would just finish on one point. I was very shocked to hear you use the phrase non passeran, which is the phrase of freedom fighters across the world against dictatorships as an argument that we should prevent admission of refugees in need of protection. I really think that this is an abuse of language. Thank you very much. Vice President Skinas, I don't know whether you wanted to 
Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I will reply to three questions and uh, starting by the no pasaran, I think uh, uh, we are in, in the light of the day and I clearly said that this is what people say, not I say. And I, I, I clearly said that there are extreme views of this phenomenon and I clearly said that I take distance from all these extremes and working to find uh, a way in between. So, uh, uh, Professor, with all due respect, I think you are not fair with me putting words in my mouth that I never said. On the screening, uh, on the screening proposal, th there you are right, this is a new element in the pact, but it's something we need. We do need a screening procedure. You have it in the Netherlands if you, if you, if you uh, land in a flight in, uh, in uh, Amsterdam, you go through a screening procedure. This is not new, it's happening, but it's happening as part of this patchwork that uh, Professor Shadai uh, and I uh, were describing. Some do it, some don't do it, but it's happening. So what we're proposing in the pact is a European system of screening that would determine things that the European Union should know about people who are coming in. A health check, a security check, an identity check and the establishment of the likelihood of obtaining asylum protection in Europe according to the uh, rate of asylum uh, protection granted from the country that the person uh, comes from. So is this, uh, does this make Europe less Europe? This is the epitome of, of being European balancing solidarity and responsibility at our external borders. And at the end of the day, why would you have a problem with Europe doing something that is done in the Netherlands? I, I don't think that the Netherlands have been accused of, of being against the rule of law. So again, uh, and that's not for Professor Geil, that's a general uh, observation. I think we need a certain de-dramatization of, of, of this discussion and focus on the texts, focus on, on practice, and uh, of course, ideology is there, will always be there, but we need to work on, 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 on what is uh, feasible, what we can do all together as Europeans. Now, very quickly, telegraphically on the three issues raised. Criminalization of NGOs. You will find nothing in our texts that implies criminalization of NGOs. On the contrary, we always said, uh, both Commissioner Johansson and myself in our public statements, that NGOs are part of the solution, that they are saving lives, that they can help us organize reception uh, adequately, that they are uh, the biggest uh, recipients of our funding uh, and they uh, help. But it goes without saying, and I think no one uh, denies that, that NGOs would have to operate with an established uh, legal framework that is set by uh, the countries where uh, they operate. And under no circumstances, I repeat, under no circumstances, NGOs can um, replace uh, or assume the tasks uh, that pertain to uh, uh, EU or national agencies involved in, in, in uh, operations. Second question was on the fundamental rights uh, in the external borders. Um, another novelty of the pact that again was not noticed enough uh, is that for the first time we are introducing legal obligations for effective fundamental rights monitoring in all our border operations, screening uh, and border procedures with the active involvement of our EU agency for fundamental rights, which is based in Vienna. So uh, the agency, the European Agency for Fundamental Rights will be involved in all procedures in the border under the pact, as is the way, but as by the way is the case also for the ASO, the European uh, uh, Union uh, Asylum Agency. So we, we not only we do not undermine the dimension of, uh, of fundamental rights at the border, but we are making it a legal obligation under, under the pact. On solidarity, finally, um, I, one of the problems, I think I discussed this, but let me say it again. One of the problems with the previous attempt of 2016 
was that we claimed for solidarity, we asked for solidarity without having the responsibility elements uh, there. Now uh, we are more optimistic, we are more confident that there is a better balance between the solidarity and the responsibility elements. That's one. Second is that within the solidarity, there is now room for everyone. I mean, there is no exit door from the responsibility to contribute to the solidarity mix. And you cannot simply pay your way out of the problem. We are introducing new uh, possibilities for solidarity, like the so-called return sponsorships, where uh, member states can assume on behalf of the European Union to organize returns of uh, those who cannot accept as uh, relocations. And these returns would be financed by the EU budget, will be attended, by, assisted by our uh, border and coast guard agencies. So we are building a, a solidarity mix with effective contributions from the donors of solidarity. And at the same time, we give the countries of first entry the assurance that they will never, never be left without help from the rest. But this kind of help that these member states would need cannot be prejudged, predetermined, because different situations arise. Member states that are more exposed to search and rescue have different needs than member states with a long uh, land border, uh, for example. So we will every year, and that's again in our pact proposal, described in detail, we will have a process, an annual process of a solidarity reserve that the Commission will uh, organize. That means we will ask for solidarity capabilities to be available in case of need. And if we have a situation where solidarity will be requested, then first thing we'll do is to see what we have in the solidarity reserve matches the needs. It may well be the case. If this is not the case, and we still need more, then the Commission will activate a second round of solidarity requests, actually seeking to match the, the remaining part with a second wave, if you like, of solidarity provision. And if even this second attempt fails, then the pact proposes for the Commission or offers to the Commission the possibility to issue an implementing act, a legal act, imposing to the member states that haven't contributed to contribute for the last missing part. So this system, the new system, which we call it the third floor, the permanent effective solidarity, is designed to cater for everyone's sensitivities both from the donor side and from the receiver side. And again, I finish as I started. I think I'm, I'm an, an optimist by nature. I think this time it may well work. Thank you very much, Vice President Kinas. Um, I wanted to go very quickly to Vincent to see whether he had any kind of final remarks um, before um, we wrap up. Thank you very much. Uh, this is always, as I mentioned uh, before, the difficulty with the pact is that there are many cross references to other documents which are still uh, uh, in ongoing negotiation. So uh, 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 as a whole, uh, the idea to have a more uh, uh, comprehensive approach is welcome, but of course, clearly uh, there are many things to, to be, uh, to be uh, redressed or corrected, but Again, the final word is given by to member states, not necessarily the commission. So uh, uh, we will see what will happen uh, in the final stage of the negotiation. Uh, clearly, uh, reinforcing the containment policy of refugees outside uh, the EU, controlling further asylum seekers, uh, perpetuating the Dublin regulation, uh, uh, they, are, they, they are bound to fail because they have failed for several decades. And this pact is trying to save it, uh, but also while mitigating uh, 
the, the divergent position among member states. So uh, clearly, uh, again, it's difficult to, uh, to have a, a definitive answer uh, 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 as long as the other instruments are not adopted. What is still interesting, and I will stop on this, uh, clearly there is an acknowledgement in this pack that the common European asylum system is part of the problem. Uh, uh, and it has been acknowledged by uh, 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 the, the Vice President Skinner. Uh, uh, it is part of the problem, uh, uh, notably because it is a non-system, uh, because uh, compliance with human rights could be more uh, uh, further developed and so on. So the common European asylum system is part of the problem, but it can become the solution if the EU is able to learn from its own mistake. And here, uh, I will uh, prefer to stay on this positive message uh, because, I mean, this is not so uh, common that uh, 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 official institutions are used to uh, uh, admit their own mistakes. And clearly here, I see the pact in uh, a positive way, uh, 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 a positive signal, the EU is able to learn from its own mistakes. But of course, this is not a carte blanche or, or, or nothing more, because the detail must be uh, finalized, and we will see if uh, the uh, uh, old habits will continue with a focus on migration control instead of protection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm very conscious of time, so I'm just going to hand over to Maria um, for any final comments. Well, <clears throat> yes. First of all, I would like to thank all of you. I would like to thank Vice President Sinas and our esteemed uh, discussants for this. Truly, a genuine interaction, you know, where many, many important issues were raised uh, with, with respect and uh, with honesty on the table regarding rule of law and other considerations. Um, and on that note, I would like also using uh, being the other Greek of the panel, I would like to say, uh, while I was listening to you, I thought of the late uh, extremely acclaimed photo reporter, Yanis Bechrakis, who died a couple of years ago. And he took some of the most iconic pictures of the so-called crisis, and they use that crisis of 2015, 2016. And when they ask him, you know, what, what is the role of, why are you doing that? Uh, and it was pictures of, of the Mediterranean mainly and people uh, arriving on the Greek islands and a very iconic picture of, of, of a father who was holding, trying to cover his baby daughter, you know, to protect her from the rain, walking on the street to the borders with the Western Balkans. And he said, because I don't want people to say I didn't know. So I think this discussion very much reflects to what extent we all know, to what extent at least the participants here and those who attend, we are aware of this daunting reality and challenge. And on that note, I would like sincerely to thank you for this discussion because it is very, very important to keep the path of, of, uh, of discussion and communication between academia and policymakers and to raise all these issues with um, with honesty, courage, uh, but also with full respect. So on that note, I would like to thank you all very, very much. I learned so much, you problematized me. And I know we took you more than an hour, an hour and 20 minutes from your afternoon. And for that, we are extremely grateful to you. And we look forward to further discussions because we cannot do justice to that. This is a perennial issue. This is an issue that will be with us. It's a human issue. Uh, I'm a migrant myself, so I totally uh, understand. I'm a lucky migrant, if I can say that. Uh, but I should stop here. So uh, being the Greek, I should stop here. So Zampia, please, you're more disciplined than me <laughs> to conclude that. Yeah. No, um, I just wanted to say a very um, quick thank you to all our speakers, to all our participants, and again to the Bickle team um, for their support organizing this, as well as the, the King's uh, College team um, and you, Maria, um, for your help on this. Um, thank you very much. Um, the recording will go, will be available on the website, um, and we will make the questions that we received um, available as well. Um, thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you all very much. Thank you Thanks. all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.